Like Justin said, my name is Amber. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I work in the Career Development Center here. So I'm going to do some short introductions for our panelists. Um, there are three panelists today. Um, Mark, um, who is in London, graduated from St. Thomas with his MBA in 2003. Um, after working in the United States for Wells Fargo for a year, he returned to his home country of France to work for a while before eventually ending up in London, where he now works as a senior director for a management consulting firm called Ancura. Um, Amanda graduated from St. Thomas in 2011 with her bachelor's degree and began her career abroad with the United States Air Force, moving to South Korea, Portugal, and then Germany. She left the military in 2019 and decided to stay in Germany where she is now working with NATO. Amanda, we thank you for your service. And Nick is a 2014 St. Thomas grad who first moved abroad to teach English for a year. And then after moving back to the US and working for a working a series of very interesting jobs with American Express, he decided to pursue an MBA degree in Barcelona, Spain. Nick is now the COO of a startup and the co-founder of another business with a Johnny, nonetheless. Um, if you would like to learn more um, about all three of our panelists, um, their long um, and wonderful bios and answers to a whole bunch of really interesting questions are on our blog, which I'm going to paste a link to in the... Oh, Izzy already got it. I forgot that Izzy was going to do that um, in the chat. So you can go read more about them there because that was just a short snippet of their history. Um, so I would, I'm going to make a recommendation. Um, as you are watching this up in the upper right hand corner of your screen, there is a little button that says view. And if you change the view to speaker view, um, when all the panelists are answering questions, you're just gonna be able to see them and see them talk rather than the entire screen with a bunch of boxes. So that makes it a little bit nicer of an experience. So without further ado, um, we're gonna get jumping into some of those questions that we have to start. And so the first question that I have to ask, um, and panelists, you are welcome to jump in whenever you feel is appropriate. You don't have to answer every question if you don't want to. Um, the first question is, did you study abroad? And if yes, how did it prepare you for living abroad after graduation? Were there any particular, particularly influential experiences or any special skills that you developed? I'll, I'll, get, I'll get going, but um, I, I did study abroad because as you explained, I'm from Magdalene, France. So I came to St. Thomas as an international student. I had the opportunity as well to study before in Canada. And that was my easy way of going into North America, but sticking with the French language and then going to Minnesota after. So it was, uh, it was very nice. And um, it does prepare you when you actually study abroad to get and work in another culture because you get to experience other people that come from all over the world to study, but also the locals that you actually go and live with. So it does prepare you for it. And I think if you've got the opportunity, and I know at the moment it's not easy to travel, but if you've got the chance to travel Holidays is one thing, but if you take it for a full year or even just a semester, it's actually quite a rich experience to do. So I would encourage everyone, if you get the chance or the opportunity to do it, uh, go ahead and, and embrace it. Yeah, I can jump in. Uh, I studied abroad in the London business semester and uh, it was a really great experience for me. I'd already been lucky enough to travel a bit in my youth and so I wasn't um, completely new to travel and London was actually a place where I kind of was a, a goal of mine to get there and live there so what was nice was realizing that it was a great place to live but it wasn't in the end where exactly I wanted to be which I found out some years later but the thing that I really took away from it um, and prepared me for living abroad later in my life was that the world kept spinning in terms of like my relationships back home. And so it was a really positive experience in terms of proof positive in terms of I could maintain my relationships at home 
and that wouldn't substantially kind of you know collapse anything with my family or friends or however that might go and it kind of showed me a way forward in the future with being able to um comfortably live abroad and maintain those relationships and be able to you know dealing with the stock market and what time that opens compared to the time difference and so it was just a nice kind of dipping the toe in uh being able to see that you know my life in minnesota as i'd known it would still be there and something i could come back to and connect with and I did not study abroad, but I had a couple of experiences at St. Thomas that still helped me for when I eventually moved abroad. Um, I, in particular, I remember some of my coursework my freshman year, I had a dual uh, paired course where my philosophy class and my political science class were paired together. And at one point during that class, we were able to have a teleconference with a bunch of students from Belarus and we did that a couple times throughout the semester where we would just get in touch and ask questions like, what's it like to live abroad? What's the day a typical student like? And that was kind of the first uh, hint there that moving abroad, yes, it's a big thing, but it's not that scary because their answer to that one was, well, what's it like to be a student in America? It's the same. People are people. And so just having experiences like that from St. Thomas and the classes facilitating discussions like that, that was really useful and made it a little bit less, less scary to eventually take that jump in moving overseas. Thank you very much. Um, next question. If any of you received advice before you went abroad, what was the best piece of advice you received or what do you wish you would have known about seeking work abroad before you did? So uh, I'll, I'll take this one first. Um, I'm the oldest in my family and I like to just kind of go out and do things sometimes before I completely think them all the way through. So maybe better to answer by saying what advice would have been helpful um, in terms of trying to find a job abroad. Uh, I was very young and eager and trying to find any way possible still after graduation to make it to London. And so I, I wrote this in my re written response, but kind of game planning for it. Um, you need patience, but you also need to game plan because even though I was at Merrill Lynch, which uh, you know, owned by Bank of America, had London offices, it doesn't just happen. Um, sometimes you look around at folks and their careers just happen to work out and, or it may look that way, that it's a simple, oh, you know, look at this opportunity they got abroad. And sometimes those opportunities in my experience, looking at my friends, it does come that way. But um, talk to people, uh, get a good mentor, find someone who's kind of done that path, reach out on LinkedIn, whatever it might be, get a coffee chat and try to put together a plan. Think a couple years into the future and try to be patient but those opportunities will come if you can set up a plan to, to make it happen. I just wanna add on to what Nick was saying about the game plan. I, you hit it right on the nose. That is one of the most important things that you can do if you're even considering in a couple of years you want to move abroad. Um, because what I found from some of my friends that have moved abroad but didn't like it and wanted moving back home is um, they never really got over that romantic idea about I'm going to go live in this big city, like I'm going to go live in London, I'm going to go live in Paris and everything's going to be amazing. But forgetting about all the logistics that comes with that, arranging for your visa, um, figuring out taxes, figuring out how the day-to-day -day life is, um, that's something that you need to put a lot of effort into researching before you even move overseas. Um, the, the ones that, friends that I have that didn't like it and went back home, that was their biggest pro problem and complaint was, well, it's not like in America. It's not like what I thought. Everything is just so different and I don't like it. Um, so if you can find out a lot of information ahead of time, that's really going to make it easier for you to find what is the right place for you. And it's really important for you to have that because if you aren't happy in your personal life abroad, you're not going to be happy at work. You can have an amazing job with an amazing company, but if you really hate the location and you are not happy in your off time, it's not going to be worth it. Well, I'll second both of you on that one. Like having a plan and doing your research, or even as you, as you said, like just have a chat with people that have done it before. 
you may hear the same story over and over, but it just helps you to build a picture of what it's going to be like to leave the world because I think I've mentioned it in my written response. It's not going to be a holiday. A holiday is nice. It's, it lasts a few days or weeks or month if you take a, a big break, but a, you know you're going back. If you're making a change for work, it may be a bit longer plan and you have to just get more into it. And yes, everything will be different. There'll be similarities, but um, everything will be different. And I think, I don't know, you picked up on something which is some shops are not open all the time, for instance, depending on the place you go to and you're so used to things. I mean, I haven't been back to Minnesota since 2012, so I'm craving to go back, but I've been back to the US on holidays, um, usually looking for Florida and a bit sunnier than Minnesota when we take a break, but uh, we look for targets. We crave for it when we go back. So there are a few things that you miss when you're abroad that you can't find uh, any comparative. So there are simple things like this that it will take time to adjust. You'll get homesick uh, in many things and it gets a bit harder. But when you plan for work, get to connect and um, make your response on LinkedIn. Everyone who's actually been traveling or connecting abroad, you will try to connect back to home. So you'll have people that have experience there. Cold connection is okay, but do send a note to explain why you're connecting uh, with someone, I would say, uh, just to articulate it. You may get no responses, but uh, connect this way and then reach out, listen. And then I got lucky to find a job through my company that was back home in France, actually had an office here. And that's how I got transferred. So it's, it's massive when you can find something like this because usually internal resources can help you. But I found this because I had found another job in London. Uh, I was going to go and work for Cisco System. And then when my company back home said, oh, no, you're not leaving. You've got an office in London. If, it, if London is where you want to go, we'll help you with that. So I got lucky in that sense that they supported me and found me a job in London. So I didn't have to change country, culture, company, job. At least I was the same company and the same culture. It's a different job, but you actually take away a few, a few barriers for you to jump to. So. Planning, I'll come back to it and let everyone say plan for it. It takes a lot of efforts, but it's quite rewarding if you if you can enjoy it that way. But it's not for everyone. So don't try to force it if it's if you think it's great, it's not for everyone. Um, but some people like it. I came here for just a few years and uh, by 2012 I should have been gone back home. That's what's the plan. And here I am, 2021 now. Um, so this is the new home. Thank you for that really great advice. Um, okay, next question. Um, what is the workplace culture like in the country that you live in? And how does it differ from what you might have expected before you moved there? And maybe what was the most difficult thing about that culture? So, this one's a little bit difficult for me to answer because I will caveat with uh, all of my experience. Ha I I've been in multinational teams, like we're talking 15 different nations coming together at once and working together. So I can't speak as a whole for Germany, but the way that we have uh, in the organizations I've worked in uh, while in Europe, it's been a huge emphasis on collaboration and also on letting people have, have their say. So what is really frustrating for me as an American sometimes is that it takes way too long to make a decision or I feel like it takes too long to make a decision. Um, but that comes back to, I've been, the feedback I've gotten from my colleagues is that you Americans, you always want to go, go, go. And then if something's wrong, you'll pivot and try to fix it and change it. Whereas we wanna do it right the first time. So that's why we take so long to plan um, and try to get as perfect as possible. So with that, it's, the big thing that's been hard for me to adjust is, um, or accept is the way that I was raised, the American way is not necessarily the correct way. Some situations it is, others it isn't. So you need to learn when to pick that battle and really whether to be pushy or just let things go and go with the flow. Yeah. I'll I'll, I'll comment on what you just said here, like, uh, I'll caveat it in the same way. I moved to London, which people say England, but it's it's a big multicultural city, so it's not like you're living in, I don't know, it's, I don't want to get the picture and the cliche, but London is very multicultural. I've worked, my company is mainly British, um, and then in British, that's where you get English, Scottish, Welsh, Irish, 
um, in England, people from the Republic of Ireland all working together. But I've got people from the continent as well. Um, so I've got other French colleagues, I've got Italians, um, I've got Portuguese as well. So it's quite multicultural in that sense, even in the work company. And one company will be very different. We had a, a new joiner, she started with us in July last year. And I'm a mentor in the company, so we're actually working together on her career. And she's like, for the first time in the last three years, I'm finally in a company where I can make plans because I see the values and I share them. And what you'll find is maybe your first tip with a job abroad, the culture of the company, once you'll be changing your whole experience, the culture doesn't fit for you. And it's hard to make plans when you have this. So hang on and try to find maybe a different job or a different company whilst you're there. When you're local, it's easier to change jobs normally. But uh, I think the culture for me was different, uh, but also very close. So I'm from France, but the northern parts, which is quite wet and rainy like London. So I'm used to summers where we don't get into the hot summer of the French Mediterranean or anything like this. So I grew up with this and I'm fine. But again, if, you're, if you miss the winter, for instance, and you go to another place, you'll miss something and you'll have to see if you can adjust, adapt to it. Some people just want to get out and they're happy to, but uh, it's, it depends on your personal experience or what you want to feel. But for work, the culture for me was easy in a sense. Um, I think I just have to adapt. People are going on holiday all the time, so they've got a lot of French exposure in that sense. So to me, it was easy to melt into that. And I usually touch on some points where people feel more connected that way because they had a, a holiday for whatever reason. They, they feel like they can connect directly, but it is nice. and. Um, I would encourage you, yes, when you come, you've got maybe a tag, you're coming from the US and you may have a tag attached to it, but be yourself and then you actually enrich people by telling them a different story and you try to move away from that cliche or whatever perception you have from people from one country. Okay. And I just saw a chat comment that went in there. So I'll try to touch on that while also going back to um, one of the previously shared answers. Um, which is talk, working with the international team and the American way, um, speaking as an American, that's, that's certainly true. And one thing to help your overall like, cultural assimilation and your workplace environment, um, it's been brought up before, so unsuccessful trips abroad usually are with people who are not as open-minded or more looking for just transplanting their lifestyle to wherever they're going, you know, and focusing on what they can't have or what they don't have. Um, if you can get yourself in the mindset of trying to live locally, wherever you're going, that's going to do wonders for you in terms of your enjoyment, in terms of people's acceptance of you, trying, just trying to speak the language goes a long way. Like I can't speak Spanish, <laughs> but I can try and people do appreciate that. And there'll be a lot more, um, giving to you when it turns out that they're going to switch to English. So, um, definitely be aware of where you're at and definitely, um, you know, realize that there are more ways than one of doing one, try to be patient, try to put yourself in their shoes and be understanding. Um, one thing of working in Italy and Spain and Southern Europe, there's definitely a slowness <laughs> and, and a bureaucracy that comes into play and for better, for worse, you know, people do identify who the Americans are and they, they know that's how we are and um, you can really rub them the wrong way and you have to kind of prove that you are willing to be flexible and willing to work their own way um, and so having that open mind trying to be localized in your other habits which will really help and if depending on which country you're in maybe not so much London because it's so international but um, I found especially in Spain luckily legal assistance is very cheap but having good lawyers um, it's a, it's interesting that you know, I've got like one lawyers work on immigration, one lawyers for my startup, and then one lawyers for the, the, the fintech business that I, I'm the CEO for. So I'm, I'm dealing with lawyers a lot, <laughs> but um, you have to learn to work with them and be your friends, but also effectively communicate with them as locals. Uh, there's a lot to be said for that. So just trying to appreciate their customs and their their way of doing things, but also their timeline of doing things. It can be frustrating, but you have to remain patient. I would, going back to the question that was in the chat about uh, challenges of working as part of the multicultural team, I would say dealing with those frustrations and conflicts between the nationalities is probably the biggest challenge. Um, like I said, I have some of my colleagues, uh, particularly the Italians I work with, 
they have their coffee schedule and that coffee schedule is set in stone. So you need to schedule around that. Well, sometimes something is urgent and you need to learn to adapt. Um, but really, I, so you have the little isms that comes with every culture that you have to kind of learn how to deal with. And at the end of the day, it's not that big of a deal. It's just something that you aren't necessarily aware of until the first time you encounter it. Um, Sometimes that can cause a little bit of friction between communicate, communication elements. Um, it, there is a really good book out there called The Culture Map. And I, I would recommend reading that if you are looking at moving or working with an international team. And that one, it, it covers the different aspects of communication. Like if you are a high context communication or long, low context. So are you explicit? Do you read between the lines? When you have a lot of nationalities working together, it's important to understand um, who you're working with and how they communicate. I was told, I went through and I read this book, and I'm like, Americans don't communicate like that. And the next meeting I went to I actually paid attention. It's like, oh, we do uh, actually communicate in a certain way. So if you can be aware of that, that is really helpful um, in the long run in building relationships. And at the end of the day, that's how you're going to be successful is by building those relationships and by building trust with who you're working with. I second that recommendation for that book. Um, it's something I found after my MBA. And one of the things I cherished the most from that was that we had international uh, representation of like 56 countries. And so coming out of that, I had a really good sense of how the different nationalities would work. And I was trying to find a way to, you know, express that to some friends back here and someone had turned me onto that book and it's a nice synopsis of that. It's, it's extremely useful. It's extremely useful. In the theme of book, there is one, uh, it's called Watching the English, which is more specific, of course, to, uh, to London and, uh, and the life here, but it's quite, it's quite good for everything to read between the line because people will not tell you everything. There is a very polite way of not telling everything into your face straight away will be a bit more direct. So you have to learn to read that and adapt in that sense. But it's it's not that complicated once you get to know the, the habit and the things. You have to queue. There is some respect and some cultural things that you have to do, which as a Frenchman, sometimes it's not always easy. You like. Why can't I just go for it? And uh, but you, you learn to adapt, and then you you scale yourself back. Just be aware of it. It's it's trying to be uh, an open mind and aware of uh, the situations you're in and your environment you're in. Thank you all, Justin. Are there any other questions before I move to the next one? Uh, folks have not uh, typed any in yet, so. Um... Yeah, okay. those, those of you with us, feel free as questions come up, go ahead and put them in the chat. Otherwise, Amber, let's let's keep rolling with what okay. you've got. Sounds good. Um, next question I have for you, um, and you maybe touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to hear more. Um, what has been the most rewarding part of working abroad? That's a tough one because uh, there's there are a lot of positives. So uh, going to the extreme, the most um, for me, like being exposed to the international community and different people has been very rewarding. Um, I'm lucky enough in both my positions that I'm in charge of hiring, so I get to choose who I work with. But there's a there's a lot of opportunity. So if you're able to get somewhere, as I have been lucky enough to be able to stay in Barcelona, um, and you can find some like-minded people. It's amazing to see not just in my own situation, but other classmates, other friends I had, being able to take ideas from where they're from, take business ideas or practices from where they're from, and transpose those somewhere else. So my business is actually a hard seltzer business. There's there's really no market or even knowledge of the product in Southern Europe. So uh, as we know in the states, it's kind of everywhere, and it's kind of a no-brainer in terms of um, well, here's a product I know fairly well, and here's something I think could be successful given the culture and the weather here just a matter of um, translating it to something understand so if you are lucky enough to get somewhere and you've got an entrepreneurial eye for things um, you can start to see different opportunities of you know things you recognize from your lifestyle from home that aren't in your new home that you might be able to bring there so i think that's the most rewarding part for me is kind of looking around and thinking about the different opportunities um, to kind of exchange culture business ideas 
I would say the most rewarding part has been the people that I've met in the places I've been. I mean, I grew up in the suburbs of St. Paul. I want, one of the reasons I joined the military was because I wanted to get out of my little hometown and see the rest of the world. And now I have, and some of the places I have been are just amazing, but the people are even better. Um, especially once you get over the fact that oh I'm friends with someone from so-and-so and just start to realize that people are people you meet some really interesting people with really interesting stories I mean granted you can get that anywhere you go if you decide to remain in the states you're going to have the same experience as part of life but sometimes it's just a bit odd for me to take a step back and realize that I am living in the middle of Europe and I have some amazing friends I have an amazing family over here um, and sometimes it's still just a little bit hard to believe. Uh, so at, at the end of the day, if I have a really bad day at work because you still have work here and you're still going to have those days at work where you come back and want to pull your hair out, just having that ability to take a step back and realize how grateful you are for where you are. I, I think that's really um uh, that's been the most valuable piece for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll second all of you on this one. The people experience is what you what you get the most of, um, because you get to meet people that are, so a certain way, you get to meet locals and you experience a new way of life. But you also get to meet uh, people like you that are coming into a different country and you connect more naturally to them because you're living through the same experience. So at first, your network is more multicultural in that sense and then you get to embed more into life and then get to meet, get to meet more locals through your work and uh, through the people you work with and then your circle expands this way personally as a as a reward as well was um it was quite interesting to have uh, the opportunity to work on the jobs that i found and in similar ways if when you move to a, a bigger city or a more international platform you get more exposure to new roles I don't think if I had stayed, I'm from a small village in, uh, in Normandy, if I had stayed there, I'd have the same chance to work on projects that I've been working on, which I find very rewarding. But um, as an example, I mean, yeah, we're talking about infrastructure projects. Um, it's one of them is in the energy sector. Uh, I was working on it last year with the nuclear power in the UK. Another one at the moment is about a, a crossing under the Thames with a highway, well, a road crossing that they want to do. So those kind of projects, if you're not here, you, or if you're not exposed to those kind of infrastructure, you may not find it if you're if you living in another place. But this is second. I think the first piece is the human adventure that you're going to get on, and it's, uh, it's the one that you can embrace and the most rewarding one. Thank you, guys. Um, so we have a question asking what the visa process is like for working abroad. So this might be most relevant for Amanda and Nick. Um, but could you touch on what the experience was like for you um, working abroad or getting abroad? Mm -hmm. So, and I'll start with the visa process is going to be different for every single location that you go to. Like, even if you are going to an EU location, um, you still have to look at the respect the sovereignty for the individual country. So like my experience is different than what Nick has gone through. Um, so for me, I actually met my husband the first time I was over here. So my husband is Dutch. So my visa is a family sponsorship one. Um, but going through that, you have to um, initiate the process through the immigration department. You have all the different paperwork you're going to fill out. Uh, you have to send it off for the initial review with the government. They're going to come back and want more documents. Sometimes they're going to want you to do things like I had to um, submit proof of our relationship. I had to submit financial documents showing that we were able to support ourselves. Um, I was exempt from the medical exam portion, but if you're from certain locations or going to other countries, they're going to want you to take a medical exam. Um, so it, it's a long process and it takes a while. Uh, I think for me, the process was six months, but I have other friends that it took them up to a year to get their visa approved before they were even allowed to come over. Um, and like I said, that's just because the process I went through is because of family. Other friends that came here purely for work, completely different process. Um, there's different requirements for a, an employer sponsored visa than a family sponsored one. Uh, and again, that'll come down to different uh, 
treaties. So like if you were moving to the Netherlands where we live right on the border of Germany and the Netherlands. So we actually live in the Netherlands. Um, there are special treaties between the US and the Netherlands that will allow entrepreneurs to come over and self-sponsor themselves. And it's a faster process. So really, if you are interested, you are your own best advocate in this process for a visa um, because no one's going to do it for you. If you want to come over, there's going to be a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of loopholes, and you need to do a lot of research ahead of time. Certainly, echo on all that is extremely valuable. I'll try to change the, my answer a bit so I don't echo too much, but with some best practices. Um, it is certainly different everywhere. I'm currently in the middle of a visa issue. So with COVID right now, things can get a little more complicated. Um, trying to build up, like if it's your first time going abroad, utilize the network. And if you're an undergrad right now, your network might be smaller. The school has a great network. Um, at one point I was looking at trying to move to Hong Kong, like after, as a possibility after undergrad and talking to the careers office, the study abroad office, I can't remember exactly who, but they had tipped me off to, there was a Hong Kong J term or study abroad and they directed me towards a grad school professor who actually ran that program. And he was gracious enough to give me 30 minutes to sit down and kind of explain what to expect in terms of how to get there, how to assimilate, what the requirements, what work I'd have to do beforehand. And so trying to find, you know, as, Amanda just mentioned, you be your own advocate. You, you have to do a little work here. And so Google's your friend. You're gonna have to figure out exactly what happens in those um, countries. What are the best practices before you go? It's a little expensive for lawyers in the States. Um, so you're gonna be doing a lot of this on your own. But as she mentioned, there's different visas in each place. And so if you're trying to get somewhere, I can say, once again, this is pre-COVID, a huge advantage is find a way in. And once you get on the ground somewhere, it's a lot easier to figure out you need to plan ahead but once you get on the ground somewhere it's a lot easier to find other visas or other ways to kind of make it work and so i've seen so many different scenarios in spain specifically of people finding little loopholes in terms of you know you can sign up as a student what are the minimum requirements for that and find a really cheap program and that just gets you there and it buys you some time and you have student status and you can change to searcher status and then you can change to like an entrepreneurship that's what i have other people I've seen do is intercompany transfers. And so, yeah, you need to do a little research, you need to do a little planning, but definitely lean on the school's network if you don't have your own and uh, reach out to folks who've, who've done it in the past specific to your country uh, that you're trying to get into because once you can figure out those little loopholes and if you know your country specific, maybe even a lawyer in that country um, could be useful for you. And don't stop at the first no in this process. There are so many different paths that to get to a visa. Don't stop at your first no. Figure out why it was a no. If it's a no that can't you can't overcome, then start looking for a different visa type. There is always a way, but you have to find the right path. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mark, is there anything you would like to add or anything you'd like to speak about your experience as an EU citizen living in the UK, especially maybe now with Brexit happening? Yeah, so it's more, it's more personal in that sense, you're right. I had to um, apply for just an admin another administrative task as a result of the Brexit vote. So to allow me to continue and work here, it wasn't luckily as a European having been here for many years. When the thing happened, I started to apply for permanent residency status, which is similar to what Amanda was saying in terms of they ask you for proof of uh, where have you lived, any any financial condition you have, and, and a lot of information back to your life since you've been in the country or your background. And that can be quite demanding to actually find all of this. Um, but then more recently, yeah, following Brexit I, in the January this year, I had to just apply something that they've made it easy for us. Uh, it was literally an app on the phone, 20 minutes to fill this in, and then a week later I had the confirmation that I could stay here and work. So it's, personally it's been easy, but uh, I would say monitor the situation. It's not because you're in a case that then you'll just find the same way after and be able to extend your situation. Things may change and just be, be aware of them. You also need to be a little bit flexible in the whole process, especially in the EU. Um, like I said, different countries are going to have different requirements. So if you do come into one where it's going to be exceedingly difficult to get into one country, but you're okay with living in the country right next to it, 
take a look at that. Like I know it is much easier to get a visa in Belgium than it is in the Netherlands. So be flexible throughout the entire process. It, it, eventually you can get to where you wanna go, but this goes back to Nick's point at the start about you need to have a plan and set up a plan, have backup plans to that plan. Thank you. Um, are there other questions, Justin? I didn't see any, but. Um, not yet, no. Nope. Okay. Feel free to sprinkle in some uh, interesting ones to the crowd mm -hmm. if you've got anything. Not that these are not interesting, but kind of like quirky or that you wouldn't typically think of in, in this type of setting. I will also throw out there a panelist. Is there anything you can think of that you just want to share? Yeah, I think um, for me, I'm a very extroverted person. I'm a very curious person. And you can't tell someone necessarily who's introverted or who's not curious to, to be that way. But I can say that if you can find yourself in a mindset of saying yes, putting yourself out there. And you know, I'm originally from also the suburbs, but the Western suburbs, I kind of knew I wanted to go abroad. And there were a lot of coffee chats. <laughs> there are a lot of conversations. A lot of talks with mentors that led up to where I am now and the opportunities that have come before me. And a lot of that just comes with putting yourself out there. And um, one thing I'll, I'll say in specifics to when you get somewhere and work and living locally is what I've already highlighted as an important factor is when you get somewhere, um, I've lived in a lot of walkable cities and I, I really love that aspect of it. And so get out and However you can, if it's a driving city, if it's a walking city, go try to see the city and experience how the people live early on. That's super valuable in terms of getting in the flow of where you're at. And, um, you know, instead of, like I mentioned before, holding on to your American lifestyle, you will find that network of internationals. You will find a network of people that might be more similar to you and people closer to your home. And so one thing, a little ritual we had is we meet up and watch um, you know, NFL on Sundays and it's at 7 p.m. instead of noon like we would at home. And so a small group of Minnesotans, we'd go to a bar, we'd go to someone's home, we'd make American food, just kind of that once a week taste of home, which was really nice um, reminder of home. And so, uh, but be open to meeting new people, be open to trying new things and that'll, that'll go a long way for you. Right, I had a list of thoughts written down and that was a lot of the same ones, so I don't want to echo them. Um, but what you were saying about you can't tell an introvert to be an extrovert, understand that, but that is something that people need to work on, or I would suggest people work on if they're um, looking to move abroad. Like I am very much an introvert, but what really helped me was um, it, I, I've had a lot of experience through university, through the military of being put in situations that I am not necessarily comfortable in. It is way outside my comfort zone but you're going to experience that a lot living overseas. And if you can find ways to practice that before you even move, you're going to adapt a lot faster and a lot easier. And adapt and keep, keep that open mindset because things are gonna go nicely. At some point, everything is gonna roll and you're gonna be in a, in a nice place and enjoying it. And something is gonna crash down and all your referential may just actually just disappear before your eyes and you'll have to just pick yourself up. Um, but it's all in all, it's a very rewarding thing because you learn from that. It's a step, it's a step and then you just learn and, and go over it. And then in the end, you become a better, like a, a more richer person that has experience of different situations. So. Go out there, meet people, talk, and then um, I can't remember who said like the worst thing you can have is people say no, or you go to the next one, and then you'll get you'll get something on the experience. Thank you. So we have another question from um, a student, and that is: Have you found the need to use a second or a third language um, in your work or in your life abroad? Not, yeah, but more so on the on the work side. So it, it really depends on what company you're working for. So if you are, if it is an absolute necessity for you, they're going to make sure that that requirement stated in the job description ahead of time and they won't hire you if you don't need it. However, there are jobs out there where you do only need English. Um, so it, I've had a year and a half experience working with Daimler and 
even though the com my location was specifically in the Netherlands, um, I did not have a need to speak Dutch or German or any other language on a day-to-day -day basis. However, it would have made my life a heck of a lot easier um, because if you are in an international environment and you have to talk to corporate headquarters, yes, people there speak English, but some of them are much more comfortable speaking German. So there would be days where I would have to have someone go make a call on my behalf because whoever I needed to talk to did not want to speak to me in English. So it may, it, it may not be required immediately, but it's something that's definitely useful. And it may be a requirement for career progression. Um, at the management level I was working at, it was sufficient. But if I ever wanted to move up to the next uh, it, management level, I would have needed to be fluent in German. So it, it really depends on the job. Yeah, the language, I mean, I, I've got the, the French and the English, but uh, at home, my wife is actually from Argentina, so I also know Spanish, so we've got the three languages just mixing, which can be helpful. The, the French, I've made use of it because one of the companies that I work for in London uh, was actually a French group, so I was able to actually be more like, closer to the people that I work with in that sense, even though I'm losing it. So I was corrected by the French uh, clients to my, with my French language, so it becomes a bit embarrassing, but you get you get through it. Um, but the, the language is, I think, something we're looking for. Even at Anchor, at the company I work for, it's not mandatory, but we highly regard in other language skills for that proximity to we work with clients internationally. So if you can have the first language, another language that can practice and engage with the clients, it's very, very valuable in the workplace. This is a question that's very uh, near and dear to me because I struggle with languages. And uh, there was a time I picked up Italian in the short time I was living in Italy. Um, but that wasn't something that came necessarily through work. That was through other, I started playing uh, semi-professional hockey and working in an art studio there. And that's where I picked up because it was kind of a sink or swim situation. But um, I, I've kind of forgotten Italian since. So um, this is important to me because this was one of the big hurdles when I was back you know, in your shoes as an undergrad looking around thinking, man, how am I going to do this? I don't have a second language. And um, still not having like a second language I could say I, I could lean on. Um, it, it's not a, an ender. It's there's definitely opportunities out there to, to make it work. You can get by, like I mentioned earlier, having some basic knowledge of the language to be able to show an attempted in communication, like in a shop or something will go a long way in terms of business. Um, it's really going to depend on where you wind up, like, and that's doing your research beforehand. I know, for instance, um, on the other end of the spectrum, my girlfriend speaks five languages and knows a bunch of dialects of Eastern European languages. So um, she it has the other end of the spectrum, but even so one of those languages is not Dutch and working with international clients around the world, um, Dutch people do like to do business in Dutch. And um, so just knowing where you're going and a little bit of, um, you know, if you can find big like Barcelona, you can get by just fine speaking English. Um, in Italy, I was living in Turin and Italians tend to speak more Italian and know less English. So it's just knowing where you're gonna be and being ready for that. Thank you. What are you doing with Catalan, Nick? Oh, no, no. <laughs> it's terrible. It's terrible. Um, I, I'll ask them to try to switch to Spanish if they can, but um, I'm, I, I'm really good at charades, which helps out. <laughs> so maybe the second language everybody should try to know is charades. Um, I have a couple more questions. Um, one, what is the biggest obstacle you have had to overcome? while living and working abroad? For the living aspect, that goes back to what I was talking about earlier about doing your homework and the logistics for what's going to be required when you get here. Um, so I have terms for my visa that I need to complete. And so some of that is uh, things you would expect like having to take language courses and reach a certain proficiency level to be able to stay here long-term. But there's other things that I didn't think I would ever have to deal with, like my driver's license. So again, this is going to depend on what country you go to. But for me, my license was no good here after six months. Uh, there's no treaty between the US and the Netherlands where I could just hand it in and exchange it. So I had to go through and take driver's lessons and go back through driver's ed and take the whole exam with COVID in the middle of everything, interrupting all of it. Um, so it's just, you're going to have these unexpected hip hiccups that come 
with trying to integrate and get settled and sometimes those are so frustrating to deal with like especially like I said my example of the driving lessons I've been driving for 15 years and I have to go back and sit next to an instructor and get corrected on every single habit that I've built up in those 15 years of driving like I, I'm, I'm brand new and so just having to deal with things like that can be insane um, for the working um, I, I would say the biggest challenge with that comes down to the job hunting at, at, to a certain extent um, because I didn't really I, I, I actually think that I got pretty lucky in finding a job here I I didn't know that there was a difference between American resumes of American CVs and European ones and I couldn't figure out why I wasn't getting an answer back from so many companies that I applied to. And then I finally got a job and I was a manager. So I was responsible for hiring. And then you see the difference in the style of applications that come in. It's like, oh, that makes a lot more sense. Um, so it, it, you're still gonna have things that you overcome but you can mitigate some of them and mentally prepare yourself for those hurdles if you are doing, I, I feel like that's the recurring theme for our chat is do your homework, <laughs> um, but it's going to help you at, at, at least be mentally prepared for what's going to come. I'll go with a bit more personal one. At, at the moment, one thing you have to be prepared of, and the world we live in is actually a perfect example of it. You might be away from friend and family and your close thing and it's that's a big thing that you have to overcome at one point because you can't just rush home or do anything if you if you need to see someone parents came over in february just before lockdown and everything started so we got lucky last year but at the moment there is no plan and the borders are closed between not even between the uk and, and france for example so be mindful that when you go somewhere you may actually have to cope with the events that are happening in your family or anything back home and you may not be able to go back so it's something to prepare yourself for. Um, but uh, all in all, yes, you, you made the choice and you may need to make it consciously that this, uh, you may not just be able to uh, go on the I-95 and get back home or wherever you need to be. I'll pass on this one. I think it was covered by uh, colleagues on the panel here. And I'll just in one word say homework, just reach out, find people and resources that have already done it. And at the school, rely on that study abroad office um, and careers office to find connections at the university that might know about the local culture there and local ways of doing it. Thanks. The last question I have, I think is a fun one. Um, if you had the choice and were to move to another country, what country would you choose next? I don't have a good reason for it, but I would go for Japan. <laughs> that That's always been like my interest in going abroad started in second grade when my teacher did a unit on Japan. And that's just kind of been my goal. I took my foreign language at St. Thomas was Japanese and I got so close. I got South Korea, but I've never made it to Japan. So bucket list, I, not for moving. At least I'll get there for a nice holiday, which but completely different, but if I had to go do it again, um, I would try, still try, probably to get to Japan. Uh, on, on the bucket list of holiday, Hawaii is a thing that springs to mind when you say where you want to go next, uh, not now, but uh, living I'm not sure. And again, I think I would encourage you before moving somewhere to get a chance to go and taste it. Um, even a holiday is going to be different than what you're going to leave, but Having your first taster is, uh, if you get a chance to do it, is uh, something that I recommend. Southern Spain is the plan we had uh, when we moved to London, was the place we were going to move next. So maybe it's still on the list somewhere, but at the moment, home is London. So, But if you say pick one, I think Southern Spain. There's a lot of British out there as well, so it won't be a big change. So. And for me, um, just the experience of living somewhere new and finding out about the local customs. I've done it a couple of times now in my career is quite intoxicating. And so it's something that you can kind of get hooked on a little bit. Uh, that being said, I am exactly where I want to be in terms of, well, right now I'm actually going through visa issues. So I'm in Minnesota for the time being, but Barcelona is exactly where I want to be. 
Um, to go somewhere new, I'd want a bigger culture shock and uh, Far East Asia would be kind of that for me. And so um, you would ask me a few years ago, it would have been Hong Kong, current events, uh, recent events there would probably change that answer along with just growing individually. And so in risk of sounding uh, boring or repeating Amanda's answer, uh, Tokyo, definitely big city and huge culture shock, great food. Um, and just uh, a, a really different way of life that looks very intriguing. Thank you. So we have a couple moments left. Do you have any parting words for our students today? Uh, mine would be, be curious, um, do your homework. And for me personally, reach out. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, happy to respond to anyone, any further questions or conversations you might have, or if you're looking for connections of who might know, don't be afraid, um, lean on the network. It's something that I graduated in 2013. It doesn't feel that long ago. And it's something I still feel comfortable going back to the different faculties and the relationships I made back then. And some I might not have a relationship. It's still the same kind of butterflies in the stomach of reaching out to someone new but don't be afraid to ask. Yeah, I think building a network is a, is a really good one. And there is never too early to start to do it. And then you may build a collection now that you may not like leverage all of a sudden, but just build that out. I mean, it makes you want like a more rounded person to actually increase that one. And then for work after, that's how you actually turn from one to the next. The jobs that I had here, the person, the job that I'm in, it's someone that hired me. This was the, I'm getting this right. Yeah, the third time that she was actually hiring me. And that's how you actually build your network with people that you can close to and comfortable with. And then one person you have to go somewhere else. And then you end up being that client or anything like this. So this is how you can actually build that, that growth. So build your network and you'll get your career to grow with your peers in that sense. And then you'll be growing that quite quickly, as quickly as, uh, not, maybe not as quickly as you want, but you'll build up a, a different uh, kind of network and then people will move on, go to different situations and you can actually call upon their help or actually learn from them going forward. So yeah, network, network is the key. Plan and network, let's do the two together and then you'll be, you'll be in a good space. It, it, the only thing I'm going to add to everything about Sipin is just make sure that you're having fun. Uh, wherever you move, whatever job you end up with, Take care of yourself. Make sure you're having fun. Make sure you're enjoying things because um, that's how you're going to get the most out of the experience. Thank you last, all. I, oh, go ahead. I was going to say last word for me, um, and I know in your shoes, this might not be what you want to hear because I know it's not what I would want to hear, but patience. Um, I, I was looking for the straight line right to London, and it was more of a convoluted circular path that took me a bunch of different places. And um, I cherish all those experiences and it, and it made me evolve into where I am now and understanding of where I want to be. And so, like I said, I'm exactly where I want to be. It might not happen right away, but if you plan it out, you can definitely make it happen. Just be patient. Thank you. I love it when other people give really, really excellent career advice so that I don't have to do it. Um, so networking, be patient, put in the work, do the homework. It's just beautiful. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today, Amanda, Nick, Mark. We really appreciate it. Um, for those of you that joined the panel, we hope that you found it useful. It was recorded. So we will find a way to make that available. Um, if you would like to let other folks know who weren't able to be here, um, but also um, all three of these folks um, have answered other questions, maybe some similar questions, and their information is on Instagram profile. Um, it is on our blog, um, and it is out there for you guys to read. So it is 11 o'clock, and we are going to wrap um, our session up today. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a good rest of your Saturday. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'll just do one final uh, plug here after, again, thank you so much, panelists. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is part of our, uh, the Office of Study Abroad's Abroad at Home um, and uh, our collaboration with 
uh, the Career Development Center, we're gonna continue shining a spotlight on our global alums so you can continue to uh, be on the lookout for more profiles. And um, uh, I wanted to also just share the link here for um, other Abroad at Home events. January is not quite over yet. And so uh, tomorrow we actually have an international film uh, discussion on force majeure. Uh, and then uh, this coming week on Wednesday, we have a panel on global to local building a sustainable future. Um, and so I want to just do a quick plug for those as well, if you're interested. So thanks again for joining us. Um, panelists, thank you again for all of your great insights. And uh, everyone have a lovely rest of your day. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, have everyone. a good day, everyone. Bye.